you have your Bibles this evening, let's go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. So two or three weeks ago, this is where we were. And um, uh, this evening I'd like to pick up where we left off uh, in verse 11. And um, uh, this evening we'll probably only get to about verse, verse 20 or 21. So we'll just read down to verse 21 uh, this evening. I thought about trying to finish up the whole chapter, but I don't think we'll make it all the way to the end. Um, in Acts chapter 3, beginning verse 11, it says, And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? As though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith, in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But these things, which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. If I were to put a title on this, I would, I would say, To God be the glory the example of Peter and John. To God be the glory, the example of Peter and John. When we were last in the book of Acts, chapter 3, Peter and John had gone together, if you'll remember, and there was a man, a certain man, verse 2 says, who was lame from his mother's womb. And in the in that appointed time that they met, and yes, I believe that it was an appointed time, this man was healed. Healed so much so that in verse 8, or well, verse 7, it says, He took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. A great miracle had taken place for this one who had been lame from his mother's womb. He was born that way. Now was leaping and walking. Something he had never done before. I 
And as I've said before, I'll say it again, we don't have gifts of healing like that, like we read about in the New Testament. However, God still does heal. I believe that. And I believe that we ought to pray for folks. Even if we know someone who was born in such a way, God still has the power to heal. Understand, beloved, that just because the gifts of healing, like what we see happen there, are no longer, that doesn't mean that God is no longer the great physician, for He is. He is. Why, I've known people that have had cancers and all sorts of problems, and, they, and they've been told by the doctor, well, you, there's nothing we can do. Just go on home. And in so many words, just go on home and die. And then they've lived, and they've lived for a long time, and they go back for a checkup, and they, they do the examination. They say, where's that cancer? It's gone. It's gone. We thank the Lord for that. Peter and John, there with this man, the people saw what happened, and they knew that because people... People in that day are no different than people of our day. And so, people of the world can only see, they can only understand what their eyes can see. Beyond that, they have no comprehension. And so they knew that this man who could no longer, who, who was born lame, now he could walk. And they knew that Peter and John were involved somehow. And so they marveled and they wondered about it. Now, in verses 11 and 12, we find there, well, verse 11, we find them wondering. Verse 12, it says, And when Peter saw it, he answered the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Peter was not out to make a name for himself, John was not out to make a name for himself. He wasn't like these faith healers, which by the way, those guys are fraudsters, imposters. They are not of God, they are of the devil. If they were of God, they would give glory to God. They would be not on TV, not have, having some big crusade somewhere, but rather they would go to the hospitals and the nursing homes and, and the places where people are sick. Peter and John were not looking for any kind of a money or anything because these folks were not out for their own glory. <clears throat> Over in Matthew chapter 5, perhaps Peter had this in mind. In Matthew chapter 5, in verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And child of God, 
even though we do not have that kind of a power or this kind of a, a gift as what Peter and John had in this Acts chapter 3, understand this, that whatever good that we do, whatever good may be done by us, God should get the glory for it. We're not here to make a name for ourselves. And if we're remembered for anything in this life, let it be remembered who we served. Let it be remembered that we were Christian. Let it be remembered that we were the servants of Christ. Over in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus <clears throat> Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6. Verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Take, excuse me. <coughs> I love Georgia, but the allergies, the pollen, don't love me. <coughs> but praise the Lord, it's been over a year since I had to shovel any snow, so I'm not going to complain about any of it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men, Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Whether it's alms or good works or whatever it is, he says, don't be, don't, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the Pharisees. They love to blow the trumpet. They love to say, here, look at what I have done. They, if, if they were if they were alive today, they'd put it on Facebook. They'd snap a selfie beside of the homeless man and say, look at what I've done as I hand him a $5 bill. You see. Trying to make a name for themselves. He said, don't do that. Matthew 23. Matthew 23, verse 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with 
one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms of feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi, rabbi. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon earth, which, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Whether it's a whether it's helping somebody out or 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 or, or uh, you know, even preaching a, a sermon or whatever it might be, you know, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. And that's the example of Peter and John here. Because, I mean, what a great thing that is. This man who was lame from his birth, now he's able to walk. Peter said, why are you looking at us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? Look there at our text in Acts chapter 3, verse 13. On down to verse 18, he says, The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his Son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath sh had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Notice that not only did Peter make sure that they weren't looking at them to receive honor for all this, he wanted to make sure that they knew that all the glory goes to God. And in this message that he preaches to them, in this message, he made sure in no uncertain terms that they knew that he was speaking of Jesus. That that's who they were servants of. And he tied all of this together the recent events of Christ dying on the cross, he tied all of that together, the, the resurrection, the, those recent events that happened with Jesus being there, he tied it all back to the Old Testament, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Understand that when we speak of Jesus, We speak of God of the Old Testament. We're not talking about two different. We're talking about one God. That the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. You see. The Trinity there. We see God the Father, God the Son being spoken of. 
All of this is connected. All of this is connected. And they needed to know. They needed to understand this. They needed to know that they were not only that Peter and John were servants of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But they also needed to know that these people, that, that they were the ones who had committed a high crime against the God of heaven. Because they were the ones who were guilty of the murder of killing Jesus. Now I know. I know that when we when we think about Jesus dying on the cross, I know that we Realized that he gave his life willingly. I know that no man took it from him. But you also have to understand that there is a sense in which, right here in this passage, that he was killed. Further on down, um, in in this, look at look look there what he says in 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 this in this passage here in verse thirteen. Sorry, in verse fourteen. He says, But you denied the Holy One and just and desired a murder to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life. Verse 15. Whom God hath raised him from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. They chose rather Barabbas, the murderer, rather than Jesus. And, and in this, Jesus calls him the Holy One and the Just. We see here, in his preaching, this impromptu message. that Peter Peter did not sugarcoat anything for them. He was bold. He was direct. And he was to the point to his Jewish audience. All we have are the words written. It's kind of hard to imagine how he spoke them. I've got a couple different audio Bibles, you know, so I like to listen to them and hear how people read and how they, how they might have imagined that Peter might have spoke these things. But I would imagine that he his voice may have raised a bit. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified His Son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied Him in the presence of Pilate when He was determined to let Him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God 
hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. What that must have felt like to those hearers. Some may have bowed their heads in shame. Others may have gotten angry at it. But he was preaching direct. I also wonder what, how, how John felt, you know, standing off to the side just watching Peter preach. You know, sometimes when you're when you're in the pulpit or when you're in the uh, when you're preaching, you get a little uh, animated, and your buddies are sitting over there. And maybe it's your wife or your family, and they get kind of nervous. Like, oh no, what's he doing? He's gonna make everybody mad here. You know, maybe maybe John kind of felt like that, or maybe John was kind of amen and preach it, brother. I don't know, but um, I would have liked to have been there. That's for sure. Because them boys knew how to preach. They were bold, they were to the point, and they were direct. And, 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 and that's the kind of preaching that's needed today. It's the opposite of what we're told we need. Because in this seeker, kind of seeker, sensitive world that we live in, we're told don't preach like that, you'll make people mad. Don't preach like that, you'll run people off. Don't preach like that, they'll get offended. That's what we're told. Now I'll tell you, we don't, it's not that preachers want to run people off or scare people away, but at the same time, we got a message to, to deliver. And we want to preach the truth. And it ought not to be sugar-coated. It ought not to be sugar-coated. The Holy Spirit will use those messages that are direct when they're presented in love. And I believe Peter was presenting this thing in love. Whether we're, whether, whatever our situation is in life, you may not be a Peter, you may not be a John, you may not be called to preach, is what I'm saying. But you may be called upon to speak to some hard people sometimes. Either through school, or work, or at the grocery store, or whatever. But let us be bold in our preaching. Let us be clear in our speaking. And let and may there never be any doubt who we are talking about when we're talking about Jesus. Because this is what people need to hear. They need to hear about the Lord. They need to know that they are sinners. They need to know what's going on. And some people just have no clue. They don't need to see us. They need to see the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, he says, For after that the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, that's this world, folks. <laughs> That's the, for after that, in the wisdom of God, America, by wisdom, knew not God. Okay, that's where we are. That's where our country is. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's what they need. That's what they need to hear.
as we kind of think about that and consider it, something I want to point out here in, in our text, the preaching of the cross, whether the memory of Jesus dying there, the memory of the resurrection, whether it's fresh on people's minds, whether there's eyewitnesses alive or not, whether it happened during their generation, or whether we're in a generation that's 2,000 years removed, the preaching doesn't change. Cultures change. Circumstances change a little bit. All that sort of thing. But the message doesn't change. The need of the people doesn't change. What the first church of Jerusalem needed to be doing is preaching Christ crucifi crucified and risen again is the same thing that we need to be preaching today. And even though those people, and I want, to, I want to point this out too because I think this is important. In verses 17 and 18, he says, And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Even though the Jews and their rulers were guilty of delivering up Jesus to be crucified, they did it in ignorance. You say, how in the world... How in the world is that? They were Jews. They knew the scriptures. Well, they didn't know them the way that they should have known. And even though Moses and the prophets, and what's that mean? That means the Old Testament. Even though the Old Testament scriptures had told them about Jesus, they missed it. They missed it. And when Jesus came, when the Messiah came, They didn't believe him. And all of his life, all of his suffering, were a fulfillment of that. And in their ignorance, they crucified him. said in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8 you don't have to turn there but um, he said which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it they would not have crucified the Lord of glory you imagine to see Jesus face to face in the flesh To have your Old Testament scriptures think you knew it all and yet come face to face with the Messiah that you've been looking for and to not know it. To not know Him. Not recognize Him. Because of the blindness of your heart. Your own pride. All those things. Someone says, well, how can that be? The same way that a person can come into church, be raised in church even, sit under the preaching of the gospel, hear the 
truth of God's Word time and time again, even live in a Christian home, and yet never be saved. Or perhaps even go for years without being saved. Until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you. And that's what happens, isn't it? It's like we see the words are there, but we don't understand until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us. And those Jews and all that, that, that was going on and everything that happened we understand that they did it in ignorance. Now, some may say, well, how in the world could a person be guilty of something and yet ignorant at the same time? I mean, because if you read his message there, he's been pretty harsh with them. tells them what happened and, and how that they denied and uh, killed the Lord, the, the Prince of Life. He says, but God raised him up. Whereof you are witnesses. He says, Well, what? How in the world? I mean, people say, Well, how, how could they be guilty? How could he preach like that if they're if they're ignorant? Well, God has a law. And ignorance of that law does not free you. From the penalty of it. You understand something? That just because a person may not know the law, even in this country, if you go and you do, do something that's against the law in the state of Georgia, you get caught and you tell the judge, well, judge, I'm sorry, I just didn't know. You realize you could still face a penalty for breaking that law. Argument of ignorance doesn't free you from the law. We find that In these, in this, they had really no excuse. Because in verse 18 he says, But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. That everything that happened was foretold in the scriptures. Now, I would say we'll stop here, but I want to stop in the next verse because Peter didn't stop here. In verse 19, he says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. No doubt some of those people were being pricked as they were convicted by the Holy Spirit. And they felt the guilt of what they had done to the Messiah. You 
Because you know as well as I do that even, even a lost man has a conscience. And we see it time and time again when we watch criminals who are put on trial and all that sort of thing and, 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 uh, and even some folks who are related to us who do us wrong, they really feel sorry for doing wrong. It's a conscience. God has given us that. when we're preaching to people, when we're witnessing to people, we can't tell them the bad news without telling them the good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ died for sins. He was buried. He rose again. And yes, we stand guilty before Him as sinners, but there's hope. He says, repent. Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. No other religion, no other religion in this world has that kind of hope. None. The Muslim don't have it. The Hindu don't have it. The Buddhist, the atheist, no one. But praise God, through Christ, there is hope. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Oh, how we need more preaching of repentance. God will grant repentance. Those who He saves. And we and, and, and I mean we ought to preach repentance. If there's no repentance, there's no salvation. But the born again believer, he's going to repent and believe. And that's a fact. That's a fact. We will stop there and uh, Lord willing, Lord willing will um, maybe finish up this chapter, um, look at some of these other things. But uh, thank the Lord. Not only for Peter and John giving God the glory, not only for Peter's message, but ultimately for Jesus Christ, who came into the world to die for sinners such as you and I. And that there is hope that we can, even if we've done something so horrible, so horrible. And I don't know about you, but I can't imagine any worse sin than being part of putting Jesus on the cross. That's pretty, that's pretty bad. But you know, whatever sin you're guilty of, there's hope for sinners through Jesus. May God have a blessing.